everyone. Thanks for joining us. It's an honor and a pleasure to have Lynn Thompson and Michael Lally, two wonderful poets with us today. Lynn will read first after I introduce her. Lynn Thompson is the current poet laureate for the city of Los Angeles. She is the author of Start with a Small Guitar, What Books Press, Beg No Pardon, winner of the Perugia Book Award and the Great Lakes College's New Writers Award, and Fretwork 2019, winner of the Marsh Hawk Poetry Prize. Thompson is a recipient of multiple awards, among them an individual art fellowship from the city of Los Angeles, a Tucson Literary Award, and a finalist nod from the Derricot Early Chapbook Prize. A Pushcart Prize nominee, her most recent work appears or is forthcoming in Ninth Letter, Black Warrior, Riviero, and Best American Poetry 2020. As a, a resident here at MPTF, I just want to take one minute and for myself and also for the Motion Picture and Television Fund, we congratulate Lynn Thompson for being named the current Port Laureate for the city of Los Angeles, indeed an honor. Lynn's poetry is poignant, empathetic, playful, has an excellent use of language. She writes splendidly about her family. What touches me deeply about Lynn is her affection for community, her compassion, and most of all, her sense of unity, which couldn't come at a better time in our country. A leader in LA poetry and a brilliant poet, Lynn Thompson. Well, Harry, I, I want to get this tape because what a fabulous introduction. Thank you so, so much. I'm thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to be here and to join Michael. I'm anxious to hear your poetry as well. So I'm going to jump right in. It did strike me as I was preparing for today that, oh my God, I'm talking to people in the entertainment industry. I wonder if I have any references like that in any of my poems. And sure enough, being a good Angelino, I do. Um, so I'm going to read a few poems to kind of set up who I am and where I come from, and then I'm going to read some of those. So this first is how I learned where we come from. When she wants him for the late meal, she calls supper soon Kingstown man, curry goat, sticky wicket, and he responds testy, not yet ready, Beckway woman, Anglican church, basket with no handles. We children, we laugh, head for the hills and the tall, sweet grasses. Listen for the lilt of frangipani tanti. She call, come in now, pigeon peas, mangoes, poor man's orchids. Then we run for true, and supper is all cassava root, callaloo, very little sugar cane. And we're in it all at once. Choir song above Mount Pleasant, Port Elizabeth harp of Paget Farm, till father, he say, no, defends his slipped on wishes for Sir Frere, Saint Souci, Wallalibu Bay, and so on into the evening, Calypso and steel drums, a little Rasta and Bob Marley for us young'uns, until we are no longer black ironwood, wood that will not float. So as you can tell, my parents were immigrants from the Caribbean. Song for two immigrants. I thought I knew you. To me, you were the Grenadines, the Anglican church, and a cricket match every Sunday. And every Sunday, you wore Fort Charlotte, the Vinci Mass, and Blue Tide Pools. You were Arawaks sailing into Kingstown Harbor. You were English and French patois. Rainforest, regatta, and a Congo snake, whelk, roti, lobster, and rum. Yet here you are in a yellowing photograph in the Mojave or Death Valley CA, looking like deserters from an American war. Her 
every bit the boy, hair slicked, leather jackets cinched at her throat. Her tiny foot on the running board of a black 37 Ford coupe, and you looking nothing less than the black Clyde Barrow, flicking the butt of your lucky strike, checking out your boys at play in the dirt, wearing short pants and high tops, everyone looking for all the world as if the Caribbean was a dream, a far yesterday away. And it was, and it's clear, I did not know you. Nothing like seeing your parents looking like they're criminals. <laughs> Soar. No one ever said housemaid or domestic. Pride matters more. And here's the truth of it. She was Tanty, a grandmothering substitute chained to Miss B, a former Hollywood come hither and Tanty's final misery. I couldn't name a single movie Miss B had starred in, but mother told me she was a first class bitch. 30 years later, watching late night television, I recalled, I met that bitch once. Ill preserved on celluloid, she fluttered there amidst her ersatz brood, but not in the same way I'd seen her flutter decrees upon my tanty. And my tanty, once a muck -a muck in her own right, having flown an airplane solo in days when most women and Negroes were grounded, half fluttered in return to make sure her family had dimes and nickels. Tanty didn't tell us she was Miss B's maid and I didn't know anything about it until I saw this black and white movie with Miss B, half a star among stars, given third place billing, nearly unrecognizable as the cold shrew I remembered flaunting dipped pearls, telling me to look and admire because I would never own anything quite like them. Tanty calmly laced Miss B's tea with what? We never knew. So that Miss B napped a little longer on afternoons when Tanty fed us sugar cubes, spoke softly of days when she'd soared. And that's a true true story. My, my great aunt did fly out of Santa Monica Airport. And when I asked my mom about it, she said, well, there was a man. I said, okay, just, I get it. <laughs> Okay, come back, Mr. Scissorhands. And this poem has a short epigraph. Kim, hold me. Edward, I can't. In my dreams, his name is hunger unspoken. His name is house still sleeping. His cigarette, wolf and cold coffee. Under my lids, his name cascades like snow, slips away like black jade. One minute, Horizo, then suddenly Cara de Cow or Nino de Vespas, and I am as old as I am. In my useless reveries, I speak more softly than the dying when I call to him. Nighthorn, root of a scream, it's then I know him as bliss, Thin air, a cock and bull story as Johnny lace up. He has lived with me without ceremony until he is, as he is, always gone. So those are all from my first book, um, Beg No Pardon. And I wanted to read a few from my last book, uh, Fretwork. Anybody remember who Kay Francis was? Ah, excellent. Because usually when I read this with uh, younger people, they're like, you know, no idea. The dresser. When she told me Kay Francis died with no one beside her bed, I understood mother remembered dressing that silver screen star, that she'd worked unseen in the trailer, a safe distance from the gems and furbelows. Yes, mammy, while Francis stood, insisted, a little shorter, no, a little longer. Oh, can't you highlight the shadows above my breasts? Mother slaved early mornings into late evenings, glad for it because money was tight, food 
scarce. So scarce, she hoped no one saw the scraps she smuggled from the studio's buffet. Hoping the bus wouldn't spoil, hoping the bits wouldn't spoil before she boarded the trolley. Finally, fingers cramping, knees throbbing from kneeling on straight pins and 1,000 colored bugle beads. Of course, she remembered as she warned in the end, we are all women alone. And this next one, if you listen closely, you might be able to pick out a few little song lyrics. Hammer and pick. Long before I came along, a dream. Daddy told his boys he was glad for any kind of work and FDR with his New Deal politics was his guy, always there. If it wasn't for the WPA, my brothers say, they would have had nothing to eat. Peace and glory. Daddy's talent to draw a bow across a fiddle wouldn't keep a roof over their heads and he was happy to go down to the sewers instead of waiting, glad to slip below the earth before sunrise to return to it in starlight, undeterred, built a railroad, swung the hammer and pick, the other men twice his size and strength, but daddy did whatever he was told. Now he's done. He wasn't thinking of history, only hoped his boys would survive another potatoes and water supper. Don't you remember? The brothers say they were better off than many. They were the ones with a drum. And I do find that I put a lot of, of uh, music into my poems, both in the sound of the poems and in the subject matter of the poems. And that's because music was always playing in our house when I grew up. Siren. Eternally lured by Calypso, Daddy wanted to return to his birthplace, to the mighty sparrow. He knew about heat's seduction, about steel pans, maracas, about the canboule, all brewed in the Indies' crucible of revolution, underpinning the peg box and scroll of a violin Daddy also favored. Yes, Vivaldi, who, his son said, couldn't best jelly roll Morton and his hep cats blowing with the Nat King Cole swingsters in every California bear joint until the money ran out. Sassy Vaughn singing black coffee and nice work if you can get it. Daddy admitted Duke and Roach with his jazz and three quarter time were superior to any minor minuet, but sometimes he had a hunger for a Polonaise, a Schoenberg, 12 tone, a Bartok sonata that his daughter drowned out with Marvin Gaye's stubborn kind of fella and Dizzy's latest platter. Still, daddy reminded us to kiss the ground of Port of Spain where stick fighting's clatter gave way to fry pans and oil drums or anything that could put a rhythm, shimmy up a rhythm and put a dip in the hip of a late night worker because that music had given birth to the flim flam singers his children were calling musicians. Men twisting their fingers so hard it seemed they'd forgotten bamboo sticks, jawbones, and Belafonte blowing into white America. Dayo! And oh, we didn't have a clue about the Akan or any other African tribe who handmade the first banjo. Calabash, Jembe, and the call of Zimbabwe's Imbera, that siren luring daddy back to his calypso. Thank you. And this one, when people ask me what was a pivotal year in my life, I always say 1968. And I would dare a lot of people to, to, of my generation to, to argue about that. It was a pretty tumultuous year. And so I had fun trying to write this poem and couldn't put a, half of the things I wanted into it. In 1968, my parents were still Negroes. Even when Lyndon Baines signed the Civil Rights Act, my parents were still Negroes who would never mourn for Malcolm X the way they would mourn 
for Dr. King. They were still Negroes because despite me lie, their son was career military. Despite the Prague Spring, they still watched wagon train and could ID every has-been on what's my line. In 1968, a minor pop star, Frankie Lyman, overdosed, heroin. But my parents were still Negroes in love with Nat King Cole and NBC. While nerve gas leaked near Skull Valley, did my folks know people freed themselves in Mauritius? In Fong Nat, there was a massacre, but Rowan and Martin kept on laughing. I graduated high school the year Sirhan killed Bobby, but my parents were still Negroes when I left for college, knowing three students were killed in an all white bowling alley, South Carolina. But a space odyssey premiered, hair debuted on Broadway, and my parents, Orthodox Negroes, didn't get the Beatles or why students were rioting in Paris. They were cheered by a Manchester team winning the European Cup, but remained mute when Pope Paul VI condemned a little white pill. My parents were still Negroes that August, but watched Chicago's convention in horror. Jerry Rubin, The Guard, The Democrats, and Daly, all the world watching his lips. You Jew sons of bitches, go home. Still, my parents were Negroes because they were no longer niggers, because my daddy drove a long black Cadillac and we lived on a cedar-lined street right next to a white man from Georgia. White South Africans, ex White South Africans excluded the Malabone Cricket Club, just as women protested Miss America. When the Irish troubles got worse and the 19th Olympiad cold cocked Mexico City, my parents didn't feel, any, feel less Negro because John Carlos, head bowed, raised his fist, but I did. The Rodney riots rocked Jamaica. The Queen of Soul won respect. At Yale, women enrolled and Miss Chisholm got the votes. In 1968, my parents were still Negroes. They never would be again. And then some newer pieces. Um, this one, anyone who's driven across the country from the east of the mid Midwest to California will perhaps recognize some of these references. 66. Mother Road, the old two-lane. Travelers may call out the names of the towns and did you see that dotting the Mother Road, but never know the why of them, like as not. If their kids' car games led someone to shout out, needles, there's probably no one to shout the town was named 1883 after pinnacles on the Arizona, Arizona side of the Colorado River. Needles, hot as an egg sliding in butter in a skillet, triple digits by lunchtime. And maybe the next kid calls out Amboy, Baghdad, or Barstow, once known as Fish Pond, but changed to honor William Barstow Strong, President Santa Fe Railroad, until the cars southerlies to Cajon Pass, then through to San Bernardino. You can still hear Nat Cole pruning it, can't you? Next, due west to Claremont, Pomona, and to Santa Monica's No Blacks Beaches. But in the old days, it didn't wind along that fast because the endless Mojave stretch was the most grueling leg of gotta get somewhere. After World War II, when you arrived in Essex, population 100, elevation little more than 1,700 feet, you would be confounded by wrecked cars, trailer homes, a stone post office, what was left of Danby, Summit, and Chambliss. The land was bleak and almost deserted, but the dreamers knew there were sweet tangerines and figs and fresh water if you just kept going. Ask the Okies, the miners and prospectors determined to find silver in Death Valley. Before the interstate come in, drivers were forbidden to smoke because forest lands were 
tinder dry, but still they kept coming. Ever flummoxed by the decision whether to swerve on the highway I-15 or Interstate 10 till they come upon a rock with blue paint, warning, trust Jesus. Years later, the Howard Johnsons, A&Ws, and McDonald's sprang up as if out of a tin can of cook's grease until the old road squinted at City of Angels, where a bit of it would be called Foothill Boulevard where it was difficult to miss the wigwam village motel silhouetting San Gabriel's mountains. Later, every driver gunned it for kicks like Martin Milner and George Meharris driving into Hollywood history in a flashy Corvette on a black and white TV screen. It seems so quaint now. We know, damn, it never was. And going back to the musical theme, um, I am willing to bet that many of you love Joni Mitchell and her music as much as I do. And so this is a poem written in a form called Villanelle that uses some of her lyrics. Sometimes the light or Joni Mitchell's ode. Blue, here is a shell for you. And sometimes there will be sorrow, but I have no regrets. Coyote. We're captive on this carousel of time. Oh, but sometimes the light. Blue, here is a shell for you and varnished weeds in window jars. Why did you pick me? And do you have any regrets, Coyote? Buy your dreams a dollar down. Heed the trumpet's call all night. Blue, here is a shell for you because the more I'm with you, pretty baby, I'm like a black crow, flying, dark, and ragged, and no regrets. Until love sucks me back that way, dreams. Dreams and false alarms, but Blue, I've got a shell for you. What point regrets, Coyote? Another treasure of Los Angeles is the artist, now 94, I believe, Betty Saar. She is an assemblage artist. Um, most recently, I think before the pandemic, she had a, a, good, a big show, both in New York and at LACMA. So this is for her, and it's called Assemblage. I was born from the time in between in the house of tarot, and I have survived. 10 secret mojos. I got a conjure bag. Got good luck tokens, some herbs. I know how to catch a unicorn because I am a spirit catcher. I am not the high priestess, but I have a view from a sorcerer's window and I have never belonged to the black crofts in the white section only. I am not one of those midnight Madonnas, but neither am I a rainbow babe in the woods. Sometimes I dream about my grandmother's house when it was Indigo Mercy. Was she bequeathed me her house of the open hand so I wouldn't live anyone's imitation of life so I could live as lullaby or Shiva, red bone and black crossing. And then I think I will just read, um, I'm looking at my time. Um, I have time for two more, Harry? Yes. Okay. Um, keepsakes. This is what happens when poets worry about people throwing words away. Keepsakes. Behind their blinds, the neighbors are whispering. I know they'll call the New York Poetry Dicks and together they'll peek in my windows and be shocked by what they see. A horde of saved words lazing about everywhere, in the daybeds, in the fireplace, atop a chest of fur belows, and they'll be aghast to know that in the freezer, the washer dryer, even in the shower are still more words. Foreign words, misspelled words, 12 body nouns that crunch like nuts and a few verbs that stick in the teeth like fresh corn. Favorite words like jive, pestilence, and vestibule. 
all looking for a home to nestle in, a place where they can have their say. Many have tried, but many have failed. For example, squash got squeezed out, rabbit was ridiculed, and frigidity, of course, was simply too unfriendly. Still, I saved them all, stowed many into trunks, gently stuffed some into creels, hid several beneath the soft soles of slippers, believing they were destined for free verses or sestinas. I've broken every law that demands we discard any words we are not using. So now I'm on the lam, never more than two steps ahead of a laid off linguist who would tremble to know that loose in my pocket are whistle and luck and forgive. And I'll close with this on my musical theme. Thank you for being such a wonderful audience and having me. More than a rhythm section, I want a band. I want a band that low towns downtown in smoky bars. I want a band that high brows with hot cats in the uptown. There is a rose in Spanish Harlem of lamp lit lofts. I want, but they say money's tight and what about a baby and you can't have it all. But I want rests and scales and a tenor voice to sing softly to me, and musicians who sit where woodwinds and brass sit, and when the best is yet to come, I want my man to tuba me, trombone me and flare my bells, to oboe and oh baby love me, till I swing low. Who will buy this wonderful feeling? Thank you. Wow, that was just wonderful. Lynn, uh, you astounded us with your superlative narratives and you know, your music inside yourself and in the poem and in the external world. And you really uplifted us and it's really been uh, a very touching and also inspiring. And I know Michael being a jazz musician, I know he probably felt the same way I did, but you really just, um, you cooked and uh, you're, you're incredible. So thank you for blessing us with your wonderful poetry. Pound said, as we all know, poetry should never stray for music or dance. And you've been with it all the way. And uh, God bless you. And thank you very much, Lynn. It's been a real pleasure and honor. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to hear Michael. Michael Lowley was born in New Jersey and presently lives there. He has been a jazz musician, Hollywood actor, radical organizer, and has had over 30 books of poetry published. I love his Swing Theory 2015 and Another Way to Play Poems 20, 1960 to 2017. He is a recipient of the Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Award and grants from the NEA. Lally has an unending strength of narrative that contains compassion, clarity, humor, love, sagacity, and generosity a magnificent poet, Michael Lally. Harry, thank you so much, man. So I, I'm having uh, some difficulties today with my, uh, you know, after that brain operation over 10 years ago, but I still use it as an excuse with the technical stuff, so I'm going to do my best. Lynn, I just want to thank you tremendously for that beautiful reading. I'm honored to be included with you at this. So because of, uh, I'm going to probably hop around. I haven't figured out how to do the technical aspect of having it on the screen and putting it in order. So I'm probably going to push the wrong button and not read the wrong poem. But the first one that, that came up was a poem I wrote in November of 1967 on John Coltrane's death. It's called Letter to... John Coltrane, and it's one of the first poems in, uh, in Another Way to Play. It was published in one of my first books, which was called Stupid Rabbits. Um, letter to John Coltrane, I believe in you. When you died, Farrell Sanders said, John Coltrane was a man of God. I thought, yes, this is all true. Like the first time I saw you, there was nothing to say except... John Coltrane is a big man, I mean, a big man. 
I remember thinking, he's too big, God. He stands out. He walked among us as though he already weren't there. JC is a serious man, people said. Your drinking days forgotten. He's clean, was the rumor. He's thoroughbred, was the word. He's trained, was the fact. You said giant steps, and they were taken. You said blue train, and it was on. You said ascension, and there we were, watching. Talk about a big man. Um, let me see if I can figure out this. Okay. This is so that was written in 1967, one of my earliest in one of my earliest books. I've been reading poetry, my poetry in places since around 1959 and getting it published since the 60s. Anyway, here's one from a few years ago that unfortunately probably resonates anytime. It's called Humans. Man, there are so many humans around these days. I mean, take a look. Humans staying up all night talking only half understanding each other, humans hurting inside each other for love, for money, for understanding, humans aging gracefully, reluctantly, fashionably, insistently, regrettably, humans eating and having sex and playing sports and reading books and throwing out trash and recycling and not, and Humans killing themselves and each other, crying and moaning and laughing and sighing and begging and giving up, giving in, giving out. Humans ignoring each other, devoting themselves to each other, betraying each other, clinging to each other, finding themselves abandoned, forgotten, dismissed, embraced, memorialized, wept over, fought over, despised, ridiculed, adored, imagined, part of another human's fantasies, regrets, permission. So many fucking humans unable to understand each other, forgive each other, allow for each other, help each other, stand up for each other, forget each other, love each other. Man, there are so many more humans around these days. Take a look. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I forget where I am. Well, I think I landed on this. I just, uh, when, Lee, when Lynn mentioned 1968, I opened a manuscript of unpublished poems, that's, and this part of it is set in the 60s, and these are the ones that I thought I would pick out to read just briefly. They're, they're all sonnets, what I call sonnets, my sonnets, Lally sonnets. So this one says, it's when I was going to the University of Iowa on a GI Bill after four years in the military, it was the 1968. Among friends from Africa, Asia, and South America, in the international workshop, I'm closest to Cambodian poet Usain Moor. On first hearing me read my poetry, he says, too much shit. I think he means extraneous ideas or images, but he means the actual word, shit. He says, there's enough shit in the world. He grew up in rural Cambodia, riding on the backs of water buffaloes in rice paddies listening to his father's stories about encountering ghosts on his way home drunk. Sam reminds me of my Irish peasant immigrant grandparents. By the way, my grandmother was a scullery maid and then a maid. Though he's experienced much more of the world than they ever did, including Iowa City. Next one. I love Usam's pure, pure spirit his dedication to his principles and people, and his love of poetry. 
He feels as I do that poetry saved his life. In a memoir he'll write, I formed a particular bond with Mike Lally. He could run circles around anyone when talking politics. I recall in a discussion about Ho Chi Minh, Michael made Uncle Ho seem like Mother Teresa. On the surface, we were exact opposites. But on the, but on the inside, we were brothers. Years later, back in Cambodia, when Paul Pot takes over, Sam will bury poems near his home, chop his hair, tear his clothes, and smear shit on him to be taken for a crazy man, not an intellectual. It'll work. He'll survive. Then one more a few sonnets later where I say, when Martin Luther King is shot, I feel the sudden shift in the atmosphere like trying to breathe underwater. It's been three years since Malcolm X's assassination. And my new radical friends in reading have opened my eyes to the realities of class in the USA. Malcolm verbally attacked white folks with impunity. But the minute he decided it was not about race, but about the poor and the wealthy, bam. King spent years fighting racism and despite attempts on his life, and tons of threats seemed invulnerable. But as soon as he organized the Poor People's Campaign, talking about the haves and have-nots, bam! I wonder if the Marxists have it right. Here's a poem called, this is, this is later, these are poems written in the last couple of years, and this one is called no, it's not the last couple of years because I'm turning 79 in a couple of weeks. Anyway, it's called Meditation on Turning 75. I get up to pee and realize the day has begun and I only had to get up once during the night, before during the night, an accomplishment I feel proud of. Though it probably just means I didn't hydrate very well yesterday and now my mind is already gone. So I take a couple of deep breaths and then go back to breathing normally concentrating on each inhalation and exhalation, trying to empty my mind of thoughts like the day ahead and how the portobello mushroom my boy yesterday will shrivel up if I don't eat it in a salad today. But I also don't want to throw out the leftovers from last night away. And I wonder if John Cage's love affair with mushrooms contributed to his long life. I remember how a young actor I met in acting class in Hollywood where I was the oldest after me and my second wife moved to Santa Monica from New York in 1982 with my two kids from my first wife. We'd been in a coma for a few years. And the teacher, Peggy Fury, would refer to me as the famous poet when I wasn't, but it made me feel important. And the young actor who changed his name from Nicholas Coppola or Coppola to Nick Cage after John Cage told me how much he thought of my latest book of poems, Hollywood Magic which I wrote, up, wrote and came up with the title of long before I had any intention of ending up in Hollywood. Yet there I was, and whoa, kind of get back to focusing on my breath. In and out, in through the nose, out through the mouth, and how many lives have I lived and yet have yet to write about or have already forgotten? Oh, it's my birthday today and I'm 75. Officially old, sir. Guess I might as well give up my weak attempt at meditation and get up and start another year. So this poem is, uh, this poem is a, a poem I wrote in the 70s when I not only, after years of being a uh, anti-war activist and civil rights activist, I became a women's rights activist, feminist, and a gay rights activist, and actually came out as gay, even though I was or am what people would call uh, bisexual, but I never liked that term because it seemed to imply two kinds of sex. But in my experience, there's as many kinds of sex as there are people. Anyway, this was for a man named Greg Millard who died from AIDS, as many of my friends and ex-lovers did. 
and I feel it's miraculous that I wasn't ever touched by that disease in a direct way. It's called Watching You Walk Away. Greg Millard, today, your back cocked hat, thick clothes for cold, the way you turned around to look again for what? It wasn't there last night. We were there. It wasn't. Why? Why not? The world is all around us, even at night, in bed, in each other's arms, distilled and injected into the odor we leave on each other's backs and thighs, between the knots and shields of all we lay down in the dark to pick up in the morning. I like your brown eyes when you talk. You know who you are. I like your knowing this. Maybe that's not enough. Let's talk, go to play, see each other sometimes, just to see each other. If you lie down in each other's bodies again, let it be for the music we hold, not the music we might make. Sorry, uh, I always hated when I was uh, when I was at. Um, poetry readings and people would shuffle papers like they didn't know what the hell they were doing, what's the matter with them? Now I'm not shuffling, shuffling, now I'm not shuffling papers, I'm shuffling, um, I'm shuffling whatever you call this in front of me, pages. And I'm going past. This is a poem that came to mind also when uh, thinking about the 60s. Um, it's a poem I wrote actually in the 60s, but uh, didn't get published in a book, I don't think, until the 70s. And it has to do with my the love of my life, my first love. And I, we were teenagers, me white or black, having a very hard time from everybody. And I wrote this poem called, just one incident that we had an encountered in Harlem in 1961. I didn't think about it. I was in Harlem with you. It was 1961 and we were alone in love, uptown, way uptown on 130 something street. Heading downtown where people didn't stare. That's all the way down. Although even there on weekends, if you went out, they might look a little bit longer than they would. Not midtown, not midtown Times Square, where out of state sailors on leave left their spit hanging from my action back, skinny shoulders, three button high front, French sport coat from Kleins on the square in Newark back in Jersey where the rest of the squares didn't want me back no more. Are you saying white and black don't mix like sheep and horses, like cement and fertilizer, like your face and their stomachs, like the way we walk down that dark street after midnight with our hands in each other's, feeling fine, and these little kids, not more than 12, 12 years out on the street, not more than 20 strong, stopped us and asked me, what the fuck I was doing up there, out there walking around with you, like there was nothing to it but to do. And I said, what I'm doing is walking on the, walking on the street with the woman I love. And I sounded a little afraid, not enough to look like I wouldn't be ready to go down if I had to, but enough to let everybody know I wasn't any hero, including myself. And you looked mad, afraid, and smiling at the same time. And some one of the others, not the leader, said, shit, let the dude and his woman go home, man. And they did. I wanted to read, uh, let's see how much time I got. I wanted to read for my friend Mindy, a poem that she's supported me about for ever since I wrote it. 
Let's see. I hope I can get to without too much trouble. Old uh, Love Never Dies, which a lot of you have probably already heard. But I'm going to read it anyway. From Indy today, today. Love never dies. Lots of shit dies. Love doesn't. Parts of me are already dead. But love isn't. My appendix, dead and buried. My prostate and a disc from my back, dead and gone too. And parts of my brain cut out with a dime-sized farm body that got in there somehow to cause so much trouble. The Twin Towers died. All those lost with them. Like a woman who was kind to me when she didn't have to be. Gone on one of those two planes, but my love for her isn't. Five of my siblings and her old man and ma passed on out for a while. But not the love we shared when we were honest. The mother of my oldest kids, my first wife, gone. But the love she and I shared never died. Though maybe the like did. My first true love, two, the love of my life, gone now for almost a decade. But my love for her and hers for me never died. Even through all of our husbands and wives and lovers over the years, when we were out of touch with each other, none of that stopped the love we felt and affirmed whenever we spoke again. Like the week she passed, still working to help troubled kids find families. Those kids still grateful for the love she showed them. That's still alive, even if she's with the ancestors now. Or other women I've lived with who have passed on, or lovers long gone, like Joan B. or Joe B. Her face so sweet and tough, boy still admonishing me to just be myself and not worry what others think. His voice so quiet and stuttering in my ear as I write this, his image on my bookshelves with his books, his art on my walls. I only wish he'd lived long enough to see it didn't matter how famous he did or didn't become. His work living on among us who love it, exhibited often since he passed. Or Tony, gone so recently, a young man who went from ripping doors off their hinges when he was upset with his wife and kids to the gentlest giant of many I've known, his ex-skinhead rages transformed as he turned the pages of his life from anger to compassion, his punk Buddhist practice enabling him to live with a rare brain disease that took his physical presence from us, but not the love we who knew him shared. I still think of him every day, as I do a lot who live now only in our hearts. Oh, lots of shit dies. Like almost everything that was new when I was a boy, including the people. If you live long enough, so much passes, it feels like another world. But it's the same one where love never dies. And I think I got one more. which uh, some of you may have heard me read. I did it at a Zoom reading this year, I think, or last year. Pretty recent. It's probably my most recent poem, I would think. And it's called Since Way Back When. By the way, I've been reading these things. I haven't seen you all. I've been coming through okay, right, Harry? Thank you, Harry. So this is called Since Way Back When. It's in... uh, quatrains, but, you know, doesn't call itself attention to itself. I had this guy write a review of my poetry once for the American Poetry Review, and he complained that I, I, that it was just working class stories unconnected to any of the literary traditions. So I wrote a letter to the editor saying, pointing out about 10 of them, leaving out the 100 more that are in there. But it was my intention always to write in a way that the kid I was and the people I grew up around could understand it. 
a lot of my poetry they couldn't understand, but most of it I wanted them to be able to understand. And I still do. So this is called Since Way Back When. Way back in the last century, in 1992, when I was a mere 50, I slipped in between the clean sheets of my bed and sighed. Thank you, thank you, as I always do. So grateful to not be sleeping in the back seat of my 56 Pontiac on Mount Rainier in 1964. Or in the airport, actually I was at a wedding on Mount Rainier and everybody slept in tents and sleeping bags. And being the Jersey punk I was, I was like, I ain't sleeping out with no bears and wolves and shit. So I slept in the back seat. Anyway, we're in the airport lounge overnight in Puerto Rico in 1974. We're in the cheap and run down open all night movie house on Skid Row in Spokane in 1964. We're in the dry fountain in Washington Square in 1959 when the buses would wake us teenage beats as they drove through the arch to turn around and go back uptown on a Fifth Avenue that wasn't one way yet. We're on an upper concrete floor of a half-built office tower in San Francisco when I was AWOL in the summer of 62. We're in a tough trans woman's bed in her loft in the Philly of 1973 or in a cot or bunk bed in the military in 62 or three or four. We're wrapped in winter coats and clothes huddled around a tiny electric heater with my two kids I was raising on my own because her mother was in a coma that lasted six years before she died and the new landlord of the building in not yet Tribeca, the illegal for living in loft I was renting, was in, had quadrupled the rent I refused to pay, so was trying to kick us out and it cut off our heat to convince me to leave and me and my kids ended up on two different friends, pulled out couches for over six months in the Manhattan of 1980, or me on another friend's floor for several weeks in Santa Monica of 83. <coughs> All my kids stayed with my second wife until I could get a place for them and me. But yet another friend's floor in Iowa City in the fall of 66, or in a patron's Brooklyn Heights apartment in the spring of 66 or on sidewalks and park benches and lawns, or subway seats back in the 1950s when the fare was a dime, or red-eye flights and trains, or passed out drunk or high in the beds of strangers in the DC and NYC of the 1970s, or on the floor of a farmhouse in upstate New York in 1960, owned by the first black farmers I'd ever met, or in a gray 49 Chevy, owned by a cohort of black military buddies, one of whom was sleeping in it too, sleeping in it too, after we failed to find lodgings that would accept us in the segregated city of Atlanta in 1962, or in a jail cell, or lockdown barracks, or beaches, there's so much more to be grateful for, not sleeping in or on, that made me sigh that thank you, thank you, that time in 1992, when I was only 50 and the young ambitious wannabe Hollywood player who slipped in beside me said, no wonder you never became the big success people predicted you'd be. It's cause you're too easily satisfied. Like with just having a bed of your own to sleep in and playing, I hope I had it. Uh, you're fabulous, Michael. Thank you for your your humanity, your love, empathy, compassion, the sorrow, and thank you for taking us along with you as you quoted in, as quoted in one of your poems, walking down the street with a woman I love in Harlem. And uh, the optimism you have through all of your life with all its uh, complications and joy and sorrow really has astonished us all. And this has really been one of the great readings both of you, Lynn and Michael, the music, the heart, and uh, the unity and the humanity above all, I think, to, just to see the humanity in each and every one of us. So um, 
I have two minutes. We have two minutes left. I would just like to take one minute for each one of you, if you could, uh, just be aware, weary, uh, aware of the time. Let's start with Lynn, since she was the first one. Lynn, when did you write your first poem? Um, my sister-in-law told me and found a poem I wrote when I was 10 for the wedding when she married my brother. So I've been scribbling since then. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you. How old were you? I was 10. 10. Okay. Uh, maybe I missed hearing that. Michael, how about you? When did you write your first poem? Yeah, I, uh, uh, I started writing as soon as I could write and uh, including poems and I have a one that I wrote to my mother in, when I was five that's in my archives at NYU. But, you know, my father was a seventh grade dropout, this Irish immigrant kid called kids, right? He had to go to work to help his family. And uh, I didn't find out till long after he was dead that he had this home repair business I worked in. He used to write rhymed quatrain poems every Christmas season or holiday season to his customers, sent, sent them out to his customers. Nobody ever told me. I was so sad that I didn't know that when I lit last. Because he, his, his advice to me is on poetry, as you guys know from some of my poetry, was you can write all the poetry you want to when you're a millionaire. Well, and you got your father. Maybe he didn't tell you, but it's in your bones. He told you through the bones. So uh, it's 2 o'clock, and this has been a real pleasure and honor. So thank you very much. Michael Lally and Lynn Thompson, and back to the woman who makes this show happen every day, every week. She does four live shows of Zooms every week for over a year. Thank oh, you, goodness. Jennifer Klamer. This is our 200th episode. So oh, fantastic. Yes. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. We are launching the 100th anniversary of MPTF, so look for us all over social media. If you're not following us right now, please do. And at, it's at MPTF on most social media. It's Motion Picture and Television Fund on Facebook. And if you follow us on YouTube, we've got two different pages. You can find others of Harry's Poetry Hour on the MPTF Studios YouTube page. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank please, you. please come Bye. back. Please, please come back. Would love to. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.